Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and first of all just a couple of announcements. Um, we're very excited here at Wellness Forum Health because we have figured out how to video stream some of the stuff that goes on here so that we can let you participate from your living room no matter where on the planet you live. So the first thing is that our Women's Health Symposium, which took place last Saturday, is now on video. If you had known about it in advance, you could have been live and asked questions, and I'm sorry about that because we just really didn't find out about it and get it working in time to tell you all, but we do have a recording of that available, and if you want to watch that, it's a five-hour program. It's chock full of information and just contact us. Uh, actually, just send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. But we do dinners here every few weeks, um, open to the public in the general Columbus area. And people come in and we feed them a nice dinner and we talk about informed decision making and diet, health and medicine, and there's a Q&A. And if you wanna participate in our next one, all you have to do is call us. This one's gonna be free because we want you to just see it. And you can ask questions too by just emailing them to us or texting them to us and we'll answer them uh, when we're in the group session. May 3rd, 6 o'clock is our next um, informed decision-making dinner. I wish we could feed you because the food here is really amazing. Unfortunately, we can't send you dinner, so you'll have to uh, just, uh, it'll suffice for you to watch the live presentation and participate in the Q&A. So if you want to do that and check this out, all you have to have is a computer or a phone that is compatible with um, signing up for this. And I tried it last night. I was the guinea pig, and the reason is because we all know I'm a technical idiot. So uh, people said, if uh, you can go home and log on to this thing and watch Dell's cooking class, then we know anybody on the planet can do it. I'm not really offended by that because I know I'm an idiot when it comes to technology. The other thing is we are just uh, five weeks away from the start of summer semester at Wellness Forum Institute, which includes the Diet Lifestyle Intervention course with the celebrity instructors, which we use in the summer. And those are Dr. Ed Esselstyn, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Goldhammer, uh, Dr. Schultz, Janice Stanger, Dr. Janice Stanger, and a whole um, group of Dr. Ralph Moss, a whole bunch of people that you definitely want to learn from. All right. So if you're interested in any of that stuff I just talked about, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com and we'll make sure we get right in touch with you. Okay, so let's get to some news. Advice to use moderation as a tool for guiding dietary decisions is really common. And I'll tell you why I think it is. It's a great way for health professionals and government agencies that are really cozy with food manufacturers and agricultural organizations to avoid telling people that there are good foods and bad foods and good dietary patterns and bad dietary patterns. So if you can just tell people to eat anything they want to in moderation, that allows you to make all of your sponsors really happy. Well, I've always advised against the concept for two reasons. And the first one is that nobody knows what moderation means and the term can mean, mean different things to different people. I'll also tell you that during 20 years of looking at food journals, I have seen a whole lot of people who do lots of things in moderation. And if you add it up, what it ends up being is a diet that is totally awful with a whole lot of foods consumed in moderation. So it really doesn't work. Well, a new study shows it doesn't work. And for one of the reasons I've said all along, that the definition of moderation is not fixed and it allows for a wide range of individual interpretation. Now to look at the effect of moderation messages on food choices, researchers conducted a three-part experiment. In the first part, 89 women were given a plate with 24 chocolate cookies. And then they were asked, how many cookies would you consider a moderate amount? And then how many would be considered overeating? Over two thirds defined moderation as greater than the, what they believed people should consume. Only 8.9% defined it as less. So it goes to the subjective nature of the, of the uh, consumer. But the second experiment was even more interesting. It involved 294 men and women who were shown a picture of fruit shaped gummy candies and then asked how much they liked them. The researchers reported that the more people said they liked the candies, the more pieces they said could be included in a moderate serving. The third experiment involved participants um, being asked about the definition of moderation for a whole variety of consumables, which included soft drinks, alcoholic drinks, alco uh, ice cream, and fast food. The more often people reported eating the particular item, the more likely they were to report that the items, their consumption of the items was within moderation. So in other words, the definition of the term moderation was not objective. Instead, people defined moderation as the amount they wanted to eat of a food they particularly liked. 
The authors wrote, quote, the reason moderation messages are so appealing is part of the problem. People are poor judges of moderate consumption, partly because the standard for moderate consumption is left up to the individual. They went on to say, the results suggest that the endorsement of moderate, moderation messages allows for a wide range of interpretations of moderate consumption. Thus, we conclude that moderate messages are unlikely to be effective for helping people to maintain or lose weight. And we here at Wellness Form Health have always felt that prescriptive communication with a great deal of specificity was much more helpful to people. Dariush Mozafarian, senior author of another study showing that moderation was ineffective for improving health outcomes, added, quote, these results suggest that in modern diets, eating, quote, everything in moderation is actually worse than eating a smaller number of healthy foods. So um, documentation for what I've been saying for years. All right, now this one's going to scare you a little bit. Since 2012, the FDA has used the term breakthrough therapy to describe drugs that may, operant term being may here, have an advantage over existing treatments for changing biomarkers based on preliminary clinical evidence. It's one of several practices used to expedite drug development and approval for serious and life-threatening conditions. As of this month, April 2015, the FDA has designated 76 drugs as breakthroughs. The problem is that doctors don't understand what the term means, and instead, most believe that the drugs are supported by significantly more evidence than actually is the case. A recent survey of doctors highlights the misunderstanding. When presented with two identical hypothetical drugs, nine out of 10 doctors chose one over the other based solely on the breakthrough designation. Both drugs had similar side effects, both were to be taken on the same schedule, were equally covered by the patient's insurance, and the only thing different was the breakthrough designation. Additionally, 52% of the doctors thought that strong evidence from randomized trials was necessary in order to earn that breakthrough label. Now, the survey went on to show even more concerning things. It showed that doctors have limited knowledge of what FDA approval in general means. 73% of the docs believe that FDA approval meant comparable effectiveness to other approved drugs. 70% believe that approval required a drug have a statistically significant and clinically important effect, and neither of those things is true. In fact, according to a 2014 analysis published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, more than one-third of drugs are approved based on a single trial without replication. Researchers reported that most trials are small, short, focused on surrogate markers rather than important endpoints like death. The group expressed concern over the lack of uniformity the FDA used to evalu evaluate evidence and concluded, quote, based on our study of the data, we cannot be certain that this expectation of FDA approval, meaning safety and efficacy, is necessarily justified given the quantity and quality of variability we saw in the drug approval process. These facts, in my opinion, highlight the importance of consumer education. You just cannot show up in a doctor's office anymore and do what you're told. The doctor does not always know best, and according to this research, most doctors, 9 out of 10 doctors, don't know best. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.